Well, I just want to welcome everybody to Renvision. Tonight we are going live and uh, we have a lot to talk about. I know that uh, uh, you're probably wondering um, what is all this uh, changing going on with Flat Six Innovations and Ellen Engineering. And tonight we're going to talk about that merger. And uh, we have a lot of good folks with us tonight on Zoom. Uh, a lot of the uh, people that are involved at the Owners Lounge have joined us tonight. So we're going to have a lot of chit chat, as they say, a lot of camaraderie going on here. We're having a good time as we've been warming up. But uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Jake. Jake, talk to us about some of this, this new engine program and what's going on with some of the ones that have, have been the uh, first out of the gate, so to speak. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, nice to be back here. It's been a while since we did anything with Renvision, certainly a live one. Uh, Bobby and I got a lot of stuff planned in the future. We're going to really crank back up a lot more of the technical content. You're going to see videos rolling out a lot more frequently. I've just been inundated with development and all sorts of stuff getting ready for this LN Flat 6 merger that we'll end up talking about. So uh, tonight, the, the main objective here is I'm just going to go over some things with with the world, and I want to let some of the people who have shared with us uh, their vehicles for us to perform this work too. Give them a floor for a little while. We got everybody here from the first purchaser of the uh, what we call the LN Flat Six merger, the first engine from that program. He just purchased it last week. is being installed now. In the next few days, the car just got picked up. So we're going to let him talk about that. He's only got a few minutes, so we'll get to him first. Then we're just going to kind of kind of pass the torch around to different owners that have, uh, like Bruce just got his car back over the weekend after getting a, a stage two four liter installed. Uh, Joby has had his car. Joby's had his car for a while now, a year and a half or so, I guess, something like that. Then we got Kurt, who's a guy that's still in queue. He's going to be one of the last of the old program. Um, we just wanted to talk to you guys about just what it's like to be a flat six innovations engine owner. And, and I'll lead that up by saying, hey, if any of you guys are Flat 6 Innovations engine owners and you purchased your engine from me directly, it means you didn't buy a car that had the engine in it or whatever, then you do rate to be in the Flat 6 Innovations owner's lounge. And you can search groups for that. It'll come up. It's a private group. Uh, I'll tell you now, if you think you're going to get in under the radar, I know every name of every purchaser, and you're not going to beat our radar. You're not going to sneak in. So don't even bother. But if you do rate to be there, you can sign up and we will grant you access and you'll be in there with a great group of guys. We've got about 100 folks in there now um, and it continues to grow every few days as somebody happens upon it. So certainly if you rate to be there, jump in, answer the questions and then we'll grant you access. All right. So uh, we're going to get straight into it with Sean. Now, Sean is the purchaser of the Flat Six Innovations LN Engineering Stage 2 4 liter M9701. That we just completed. I built that engine myself here personally at the training facility where I'm doing all of this work now as we're doing the merger. I'm building the engines that that will kind of pick up with a new program while the rest of my crew is finishing up the engines that are finishing up the old program. So by the time we get to what we call the end of the line where all of the old engines are built then my other builders will jump right back in and start taking over the new program. And we've got that worked out like a well-oiled machine. All right, Sean, if you want to unmute, then uh, we can kind of give yep. the floor to you and you can talk a little bit about, because it was interesting, you know, when I decided that we were going to tag the line and we were going to do this thing after Charles and I talking about it for 10 years, um, you know, we were basically right there in the process of you being in the old program. But the thing was, we we pretty much had lost our parts allocations. We couldn't get those parts. And I'm like, look, this is the time to do this. We're going to go through a stalemate where we can't get parts. And we did. But luckily, we had enough inventory of stuff to get us through the stalemate. But it made a good time for us to just chop that line off and say, no more. We haven't sold an engine since last February. And you were right there at that. So take us yep. through a little bit about what happened there, why you wanted this engine, and, and why you're doing what you're doing. Well, you you remember, I, I still remember when I got the phone call from you and that you had to tag the line and I was, I was sad. There's no other way to put it. I, you know, I, you know, I drug my feet through one of the web, you know, one of the webinars and didn't, didn't pull the trigger to get rolling and then decided to, and then 
when you tagged the line, I figured it was going to be another, you know, another year, year and a half or two years more. And then, you know, when, when I got the, when I got the call that the new, the new program was starting up, um, I was surprised at how quickly, you know, how quickly you started building engines and, and the fact that one was ready so soon. I mean, I had planned, I had planned for engine one probably to be somewhere in the second half of this year. So was very surprised, but made the decision to jump on it. And I think uh, two big reasons. One, I, you know, the, the, it was cool to have the first engine in the new program and the fact that you build it yourself. That was a, you know, that, that to me is a big deal. I know, you know, I know what you've put into building the business. I know what you've put into developing everything you've developed for these engines. And so to be able to have both the first one in the new program and the one that you personally built was, was you know, something, something that I couldn't pass up. And, you know, I'm coming out from a time perspective, I'm coming out probably yeah. what, eight months sooner than my original contract was because this one, you know, this, this one popped up. I was fortunate to be able to, to jump and be, be the first one to buy it. And Andy picked up my car today and he said, he's going to try and have it back to me by the weekend. So you know, wow. it's, it's been, it's been a, been an awesome experience. And you probably saw, I actually got to touch my engine for a minute or two today because it was in, it was in his trailer. So I, uh, we pulled the cover off. I got to take a look at it, snuck a little picture of it and then lo loaded up a car and it went on its way. Great. Yeah. And I was thinking about that, that you actually came out better than you would have if you had to wait, yeah. because there was guys that beat you by a few seconds um, yeah. to be able to purchase that engine, their their engine for the old program. And then we got Kurt in here, which we're going to talk to later, because he's one of the final guys we're ending the old program with. And, um, and then I got Sean Wheeler, who was not in here, but he is a guy that, that I'm doing an R40 for. That's almost like what I did for Abe, just a little bit different. And, you know, he also missed out, but he wanted an R series. So, you know, I had enough stuff to build one more of those. And um, so now I'll be doing his car here pretty soon. And he'll actually get his car back about the same time that he would have gotten it back if he was able to join that list back then. Um, so things, things definitely change because the parts thing has gotten a little better. You know, at least the things that, that we manufacture, you know, we've tried to take advantage of this whole thing. And that's one reason why I've joined the LN team as a freelance developer, uh, heading up the developmental side of things is basically because now we need to make parts because we can't trust the Germans and anybody else to get things for us. So it's, it's COVID was a bad thing and a good thing. You know, it, it showed us where the weaknesses were and it showed us that there was a demand and it showed us basically what we needed to focus on. And, um, you know, it was a real wake up call for everybody, but you know, we're real lucky that we were able to get everything done. We still haven't been late um, with getting an engine done. Some of the installs have taken a little bit longer because of weather and this and that and some stupid outside parts holding us up. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a unique perspective, uh, that, that you and I kind of thought the same thing that you're actually coming out better time-wise than you would have under the old program. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and, you know, the, the spec you built this to was, was almost exactly what I, what I wanted. And I remember, I remember talking to you, you know, before you tagged the line about pistons and at that point in time you weren't sure that you that cp was going to be making them in the, in the time frame you needed so again i ended up with i ended up with pretty much the the add-ons that i was leaning towards anyway so and yeah and at that time cp was about 40 weeks out now they're about yeah. 12 to 16 so it's not as bad but one reason for that is because the demand has kind of dropped some it's not that they're doing better it's just the demand is kind of leveled off some across the board of motorsport stuff so uh that crazy covid uh rush uh it really isn't there anymore as far as that goes shortages are still remaining for certain things but you know as soon as we lost our our the parts lineups as soon as the, those those you know everything we had coming in when i saw that getting cut off the ships couldn't unpack all that sort of thing i'm like man we're going to get stuck well i don't want to take these jobs on we're going to have jobs we can't complete but luckily knock on wood that has not been the case we currently have all the parts to get us through the end of the line and then i have parts for eight engines of the new program but with a new program just like what we did with yours there's no corner cutting at all. People are like, oh, these, they're mass producing these things. No, it's exactly opposite from that. We're giving them yeah. everything. So it gets everything. 
uh, from from a, a balance perspective, component perspective, all of that. So it's a, a much different different focus because, like I said in those videos, you got to see um, as soon as we leave something out of one, then people will be like, "Well, I would have bought that if it had those pistons or if it had those rings or whatever the case may be." So, um, and luckily the higher end parts we can still get. That's the thing that the, the shortages really weren't affecting them as much as the mainstay stuff. So some guys got updates. They got CP pistons um, when they didn't even order them because we couldn't get the other pistons. So they got an upgrade that they never even paid for. I paid for it. So it, we were able to, to work through it. So I'm glad you were able to end up with that engine. Um, and, it, you know, working with, with a certified installer the way that you are, uh, Andy is literally like across the street from LN. So, you know, it's almost like having the engine put in right there. If there's a part that he needs or something, it's just go across the street. If they don't have it, they'll manufacture it. Um, so that's a, a good thing. All right. We might have lost Sean. I don't know. Lost his audio anyway. Yeah, he's still there, but. Um... Oh. I think he may uh, have had to mute because it looks like he's in his car driving. Yeah, maybe but, uh, so. But I have to say that this part shortage thing was a real deal because as you're watching all the forums, you can see how people were affected on the ground level of just simple stuff trying to replace on their cars. They couldn't get the parts and they didn't think it was a big deal. And they try to, you know, they try to order it and then they get this message saying it's you know, no longer available or it's just going to be months and months before they'll, they'll ever get it. So the the semiconductor thing and, and everything that's going on, uh, you know, with Ukraine and uh, it, it, it was just kind of like a per COVID and all that. It, it was a perfect storm. I mean, I I don't know how it is on some of these with the everybody that's here tonight that's watching. I don't know what it's like in your areas, but in our area, uh, the dealerships didn't have anything on their lot new. And they, you know, I can't speak for Porsche, but I know that the headquarters in, is in Atlanta and they didn't even have any 911, new 911 or anything like that on uh, the, the two big dealerships down in Atlanta. So that says a lot. You can imagine that people that need their cars fixed, they can't get their parts. It, it's just really, really bad news. But I remember Jake telling me that he was having his uh, procurement uh, manager working 24 seven trying to find every portion part there is available. Isn't that right, Jake? Yeah. And, Cause the thing is the backlog that we had went from being, you know, basically a lot, it went to a liability because at that point, if you can't get the work done, cause you can't get the parts, then you end up in a scenario where you got all these jobs you can't do. And that proved to me, I didn't want to do that anymore. And it, because working out of that hole you know, when you can't get parts is very difficult, but we, we didn't miss any dates. I mean, we, I think we missed one date because of camshafts, but, you know, and I'll say this part shortage thing's not over guys. We're going to continue having this um, right now. It's not as bad for the internal parts, but a lot of the Bosch parts, try to find a starter, try to find an alternator, um, try to find knock sensors. We just went, th we're going through that right now. Rebecca's going through having a hard time finding knock sensors, crank position sensors, um, so we're not through with that. The internal parts are not as bad for us anymore because at LN we were able to kind of step up and manufacture a lot of it and use buying power to get some of the other things. Um, but it's not over, and it's not going to be over for a long time. So it was, it, it, I was I was just told it's going to be a minimum of a month for a power steering cap for my 911. Yeah. Well, uh, I got there, there's none available in the world. And they said that the earliest one is like 12 to 16 weeks or something like that out of Germany. Well, just just drive over and get one. I got like 20 of them laying <laughs> over here. So <laughs> uh, I'll be up there uh, next Tuesday. OK. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it's a challenge to work with this stuff. But that's one reason why I decided to, to make it where we didn't worry about that anymore. We with this new program engines aren't available until they're done and in the crate when sean bought that engine it was done it was a hundred percent done when that thing went live and he bought it in like 40 seconds or whatever it was after charles had hit go on the ln site um it was done it didn't need anything else done to it so when andy said he can come pick it up i'm like okay here let me saran wrap it real quick come grab it 
that's what I liked because I really don't like people having a scenario where I have to apologize because I can't get something done or I can't get a part. And we haven't really been in that scenario. And with a new program, we never will because it'll only be sold when it's completed. Um, and that's that's unique, especially considering that we're doing that and we're not mass producing it. We're throwing everything at it that we've got. Um, because, like I said, typically mass production goes along with those types of things. But So we're making the engines better than they ever have been, and the same people are building them. Um, it's just we don't have to deal with the public. It's all gone private label, and every one of us here really appreciates that. Um, okay, so talk to Sean. I know he's got to go pick up his daughter or something here in a couple minutes. So um, nice talking to you, Sean. I'm, I'm glad that uh, that you'll be able to have Andy get that car turned around. That If he gets it turned around this weekend, that's going to be a world record as far as a sale and an install and a turnaround. Um, that's that's epic. So Yeah, I was, I was shocked. <laughs> Well, and you just hit him just right. You know, most of the time yeah. that can't happen. I mean, he's just, he does a lot of racing with Tony Callis. He does a lot of the ground support stuff and all that with Tony. So Tony's not really getting cranked up yet. But, you know, if it would have been another couple of weeks, Daytona would be getting in the way. So, you know, definitely that was a, a good thing. All right. So, Bruce, if you're with us, Bruce just got his Stage 2 4-liter back over this past weekend. And... um Bruce actually asked for a late delivery date when we built his engine at the time it was a late delivery date. Now that was like two years ago or something like that. Um, so we got it completed and he just took delivery of it. So, uh, Bruce, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah, we got you. Yeah, I was having problems with uh, my video, so I'm just going to be audio only. Yeah. I've had the car back for 26 hours now and it was a 24 month wait. And that was my fault. I asked Jake to give me a, a late delivery date and he did it unfortunately. And so it made my uh, wait a little longer, but really my journey started uh, back in January of 2019 when I took the uh, M96 or M9X uh, rebuild class and uh, learned uh a little bit about the rebuilding of the M9X. And then I ended up buying a Boxster motor so I could practice the rebuilding, bought the tools and then bought Jake's DVD series. And so that uh, poor little Boxster motor got rebuilt at least a dozen times, you know, complete tear down <laughs> or rebuild. I would reuse gaskets because I wasn't too worried about them sealing. But you know, I got to know the uh, the the M96 engine fairly well. Uh, but uh, my plan was to rebuild the motor in my 996.2 uh, in uh, 2024 after you know my planned retirement. And uh, the more I thought about it, and after talking with my wife, she she said, you know, you're going to retire and then spend all your time rebuilding a motor. And she, she asked me, In, couldn't somebody rebuild it for you? I said, yeah, <laughs> there's only one person I trust with my car, with, with my engine. And uh, I said, that'd be Jake. And uh, she didn't know who he was then, but she does now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the engine came back. Uh, I mean, the car came back uh, yesterday at uh, just a little, a little after 6 p.m. And I've gotten to take it for a couple of drives already, and it's everything I'd hoped it would be. Uh, and the whole process was easy. I'm I'm real picky about what happens to my car because normally I do all the work on my car except for alignments and tire mounting. And uh, it was hard for me, you know, it's hard for me to give control away and and you know have to have to worry about if the person that's doing the work on my car knows what they're doing. And uh, I didn't have to worry about that with flat flat six. I, you know, I I knew that the people building the engines that they had to they had to do it Jake's way. They had to do it the right way. That they couldn't take shortcuts. They couldn't do things that are good enough. I I knew it would be done right. And working with Judd, you know, I I uh, uh, got great communication. Anytime I had a question, it was answered right away, but I really didn't have to ask many questions because I just knew that, you know, I had the experts uh, building the engine and the guys 
putting the engine in or were guys that uh, that Jake had vetted. So, you know, it was a, a very worry-free process. Well, that's great. And, you know, the main thing that we're doing with the new program is maintaining all that. You know, we've given all the certified installers not just training, but we've also – we are in the process of handing over to them – all of our checklists and all of the things that we use to manage this, literally the tools that we've created to to help people and manage this and make sure that everybody knows, that, you know, if there's anything pre-existing with a car or or whatever, they get all that. So the only thing really has changed is they're just buying the engine from LN instead of paying me, and they're not working with me because I'm behind the curtain over here doing whatever else. Um, but the end result's the same, and, and we've done that because we've been working with other uh, purchasers since 2015. We've done about 40 of these what we call on-demand or premier jobs where certified installers install them, and one of the certified installers has done it like 11 times. So um, you know, the idea is to maintain all of that, and of course, with Judd going to l Engineering to support those initiatives of sales and support – a lot of people won't even realize there's a difference. That's the the overall goal. The main thing is you won't have to 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 wait as long. You know that's the the main thing. So uh, unless you want to, obviously you can kind of pull the trigger whenever you want to. So with you, um, you know your car is very well prepped. You know we see kind of both ends of the spectrum here. We see guys that just want a big engine and a all stock car which i like that because i like things that are stealth and then we see a car like yours that's very well prepared so you did a lot of good work to that car aero wise suspension wise brake wise um uh, ava and i drove that car uh, and she she liked it by the way she's like i, I like this car and she didn't oh. say that about very many of them um but we drove it around one night and put about 50 miles on it and um and i you know i, I like that particular the 9962, I like I like that combo that you did. It kind of reminds me a lot of the the land speed car that that my wife set the land speed records in. It was it was a 9961, but as far as prep goes, it was almost exactly like your car. Oh, great. Yeah, that's uh before COVID, it was my daily driver. And but I like a, a little sporty, but I didn't want it to be a track only car. And so it's kind of a, a combination there. It, it's one that I, I know I can take to the track. And now it's got the engine that I know will survive the track. Uh, but it, it can do daily driving duty also. Yeah, and it's kind of like an ad that I did years ago. It was like Dr. Phil and Mr. Speed. I had a, a customer who was a, a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon. And, and the only way he could take his mind off of his work was going to the track. And he drove his car daily. And then he took it to the track and, and he was able to do both. So I came up with an ad that was like half, you know, half surgeon, half, half, you know, track driver. Right. And, um, and it, and it really fit the bill for the stage two, which is what that's made for. It's made so you can drive it every day if you want to don't lose any manners or anything. And then you can take it to the track and you don't have to worry about all the things blowing up on it that you normally have to worry about. Right. Well, yeah, I, right? I, I like that you have the, uh, the, certified installers because if it was just you know anybody can install it you would never know if it's done right and you know that's if i'm not doing it i want to make sure it's done right and i like that it it is being done by people that you have vetted personally made sure that you know they know how to do it and that they follow the the correct procedure well, and the thing is, I think people have to have something to lose to really do a job well. Like with me, I like to do a job well because I take pride in that because this to me has never been a job. It's never been work. Um, so that's a difference. If you take it to a regular shop, it's not their engine. It's not their car. Sometimes they get mad because you didn't have them build it. So a regular shop don't work. So the idea – most of these certified installers are guys that really became my friends after they came to my hands-on classes because I was able to connect with them. You know, you get 20 guys in a class from all over the world. Most of them are, are pro technicians, at least back in the day when they were learning about these engines from me, uh, you know, almost 15 years ago at this point. 
but you would be able to look across that room and you're like, I know this guy knows what's going on. And when you go downstairs and start working on the engine, you can tell who has worked on stuff. You can tell who the guys are that just sit around in the shop versus the guys that get things done. And those are the people that on the last day of the class, I'd say, you, 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 and you. Or sometimes it was just one person. Stay back. Once everybody else is, is dismissed, I want you to stay back. And I would say, look, this is what I'm going to offer to you. Then word got around that I was doing that, so people started coming to the classes just for the sole purpose of trying to be a certified installer. Well, then I would be like, okay, on the day day number one, I, I said, well, if you came here to be a certified installer, I can already look across here and tell who you are, and you will not be effective because I wanted to organically select those people when they didn't know they were being watched. Um you know, and that worked really well. So the vast majority of those certified installers have been with us since 2012 when we first started doing it for the IMS solution. And, you know, we've never had a certified installer install an engine that had a problem, luckily, which is kind of odd. I mean, you're doing it that much, you know, hundreds of times at this point, we should have had something happen, but we haven't. Um, but sometimes the guys get, get mad. They're like, well, you know, I, I trust my shop. I don't trust anybody else. Well, sorry, I don't trust your shop because I only trust the people that I trust because I know they're going to do it my way. Right. Um, you know, I want to make sure they're going to follow those checklists. They're going to follow those protocols. They're going to know how to reciprocate with Judd because Judd's still an instrumental part of this. He's still handling the, the support side of things. He's going to make sure that that shop does what they're supposed to do. Um, in, in, in shops, guys, I'm going to tell you, we're having a hell of a time. All shops are. It hasn't really impacted me because my guys have been with me for years and years, and, and they're super loyal. But, you know, a regular shop has got a lot of fresh meat working there. I just have to tell you, the majority of these shops have got new people because people left them for whatever reason. They didn't come back to work, whatever the case may be. Maybe the, the older techs moved into an admin position. They tried to replace them with a, a younger tech or a newer tech. It, it's tough. And, and, I mean, like I told the guys in the owner's lounge, you guys better learn how to work on your own cars. That's all I got to tell you because this whole wave of electric cars coming in has completely derailed anybody and everybody that is of the younger generation that thought they might want to work on cars because they can see it has no depth. They're like, you know, if anything, they want to go work work on electric stuff. But, you know, I mean. It's not fun. I mean, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's like you're working on a freaking sewing machine or something. I mean, what's cool about that? Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, but, you need some soul, though. You need, yeah. you need something else going on there. Yeah, I completely agree, and I see that in my company too. It's you know you need you need people with passion. Yeah, and they just they don't have it anymore. You know, you just don't have it. I mean, there's more passion for kids playing a video game than there is anything else. Uh, and, and it blows me away how many kids get or get educated by watching video games. You know, I collect firearms, so I got a lot of really old, cool, rare stuff. And I'm like, yeah, here's an MP40 machine gun. A kid knows what that is. He's like, oh, I played that on what's it? Yeah, they know what that is because they played a video game with it. They don't know it because of its historical value. They just know that it was part of a video game. So I'm telling you, you know, these cars, the M96 and 97 cars, are some of the last cars that you guys can really own and be capable do-it-yourselfers, you know? Uh, the the nine alpha one cars and newer get tough. It gets tougher. You got to have better scan tools. You know, the integration's different. The alarm modules are different. Everything's tougher. So you know, you guys got the last of of some good cars, and, and you can actually work on them because it's going to be hard to find anybody to work on them as we get closer and closer to electric mobilization. So I'll I'll just jump in here and say too. Uh, as an example of that, we all know that we, most of us here are do-it-yourselfers, and we can do quite a bit of stuff on our cars. But when something goes on with the ECU, for example, let's just say the big key fob thing, everybody chuckles because Porsche doesn't make the best key fobs. I've had three Porsches. They don't. <laughs> I've had lots of cars that make great key fobs, but they just, for some reason, their key fobs really suck. But guess what? You just can't fix that yourself, right? You got to go to the dealership and they have to hook it up through, uh, you know, their 
their computer system and they had to have these iPass codes and all this kind of thing. And you have to have all this clearance and yada, 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 yada. And I kind of see that's where things are going to be going is that they're going to be controlling these cars with computer systems and, and code programming. And they're going to have more control over you as an owner. Uh, as a do-it-yourself, you're, you're not going to be able to crack some of these codes to be able to fix and repair some of these cars. It's so just kind of like the key fobs where people just get so frustrated. I always get a laugh at these people try to, you know, they put their keys in the oven, you know, to bake the electronic board or they'll put their battery in backwards and try to get that thing to, to talk and they try everything. And it seems like nine out of 10 times it never, never talked to the car. So they have to take the car to the dealership and they hook it to the computer and go through and end up spending $500 for another key fob. So the point being is I see the, the modern cars, especially with the EVs, are going to be more sophisticated and require uh, computer systems that have uh, very tight uh, control over who is, ac is able to access them. So you're not going to be able to do it with your little scanner. You're going to have to go through their systems. Oh, that's all a subscription service now. There you go. Like, yeah. yeah. BMW is already testing it on heated seats and stuff like that, where you pay monthly to have that activated. Like, it's it's ridiculous. Well, and see, the thing is, it's not even just cars. John Deere oh, tractors. No. Tractors are yeah. the same way. Guys can't even oh, work on a freaking tractor. I think, I think tractors are worse because they have more of a lockdown. It's not a standard protocol like OBD2 for, you know, a car. So you can't even get the basics. It's all proprietary stuff based on the manufacturer. It's crazy. But yeah, I mean, my neighbor, the... my neighbor's got two huge John Deere's. He bought one. Something happened to it. It was like some lemon. He took it back, and then he went and bought an old 4020 John Deere, which is a mechanical diesel. Yeah. <laughs> nothing happens to it. There's nothing to break. It, no, you got like three thing, wires that run the thing. Yeah. And they they <laughs> shut it off. Those wires shut the engine off. Uh, you know, it don't even need a starter. You can drag the thing around and pop the clutch and start it up. I mean, and that's he was just like, I'm done with this modern stuff. And it's gonna it's gonna keep on getting to the point where everything is impossible to interface with. You know, it's just it's and the, the nine alpha one and newer cars are already that way in a lot of ways, you know. My my you can view, actually play nine video nine games. six, nine nine seven is like the epitome you still have mechanical you know steering you have an actual power steering pump not an electric pump you've got like yeah it's got traction control but not really um it's just working yeah. the brakes like those are the last of the cars where like you can actually do some things yourself and yeah, see the I thing like is, is my just... car doesn't have tpms you know it's just yeah. something else that's broken on almost every car out there that's more than yeah. six or seven years old well and the thing is that you know it what really gets me about it is people say why would somebody want to spend 30 or forty thousand dollars one of these engines or 50 or 60 or 75 like what a r series is right uh so the reason why is because a certain group of very smart, wise individuals understand what we're talking about. They understand already that they know this is the last of that generation of cars. It's never going to go back and be simpler. These cars are never going to be made simpler at all. They're also never going to be made better. A, a good example, I've got a 1992 Mercedes 500E. OK, you could not give me a modern Mercedes. OK, but my car has over 300,000 miles on it. It's had the time and chain and tensioner changed like three times. The engine's never been rebuilt. The engine's never been out of the car. I drove it 100 miles over the weekend. I'll drive that car anywhere. It still looks new. There's nothing broken on that car. OK, you know, at this point, it's almost 32 years old. I can't tell you a time when anything has broken on that car. The only thing that I've had to replace in the last five years is the coolant temperature sensor because it started running lean and everything with OBD O runs off the coolant temperature sensor. So at least it was easy to diagnose. Back in those days, the first thing you did was replace a coolant temperature sensor when an engine started running weird. It was fuel injected. So um, and it has two, so it was a little bit confusing which one it was. But you know, you're never gonna have a car like that again. And that's the reason why this stuff is going to be bringing more money. People are going to be holding on to these cars for years. You know, and I hear it all the time. 
I could go buy a new this or I could go buy a new that, but I like my X, whatever the X is. It may be a 996. It may be a 997. It may be a Cayman or a Boxster. I mean, well, you know. Boys, I got to uh, say this, Jack. I got to say this, man, before you get off the, off the topic of that 500. I got to borrow that car <laughs> for two days. That is that is a beast of a car, people. <laughs> I, I had so much fun with that car. I I took care of I was very careful because I knew it was Jake's. We were doing some work together to let me borrow it. That car wide open would fly. It has so much power. It is the, to me, the benchmark standard for sleeper. You really do not understand when you punch that thing, it'll set you back. It is, it roars too, Jake. Now, am I telling, am I stretching oh, yeah. this? It's, I know this is the big fish story here, but. Bobby, Bobby never went thing past 50% was, throttle wow. though. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm going down the road, people looking at me. I'm just like screaming, screaming, like tears coming out of my eyes as I'm flying this thing. God, I hope there's not a cop around that curve because I'm that, having so much fun in this thing, man. But like, in a Tesla, in car, a Tesla can you drive it. A Tesla will drive you down the road while you play video games on the Tesla. Oh, so, Lord. yeah, but <laughs> you don't actually live it. But, but if that Mercedes was an electric vehicle, the batteries would have had to have been replaced in about 2002 <laughs> and again in about 2012, and the battery pack would have to be replaced again right about now. That, that See, and the thing fine. is, how do you how do you know they're going to keep on making the battery pack? Maybe or they decide they do, it's, it's a twenty thousand dollar battery pack each time. You'd be sixty thousand dollars into battery packs, and it'd be stock. You see, this is the thing nobody's really realized, thinking about. The way they make you buy a new car is we no longer support that. It's like software. Okay, right. I like I like Windows XP. I'm a Mac guy, but all my older stuff uses Windows XP on my old, you know, my old yeah. stuff. For you can't use your iPhone 4 anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So well, they do the same damn thing with this. All of a sudden, oh. We're not gonna um we're not gonna sell you a battery pack. That's that's obsolete. So you're screwed. You gotta buy a new Tesla. Yeah. You know, we changed our proprietary connector to charge this. So you know yeah. we're like a K car in the 70s. It's yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the technology the, the technology has changed. We we you know now that we're not using a lithium battery, we're using a try whatever, whatever they come up with, uh, that'll be the new thing at that point. So but it's a joke. The whole thing's a joke. Well, what it has done is it has taken away that soul from these kids that like cars. It's changed them. They don't want to be working on things anymore. They don't want to. They don't want to work. Period. Nobody wants to work. But they damn sure don't want to work on something that is going to go away in well, the middle I mean of their career. I mean, and that's fair to be honest. Even if they're really into cars, like. Can you get into a carburetor now and make that your career? It's done, you know. Yeah, and well, that's and the sad. thing is, that's a sad thing, in my opinion. But it, well, it is just, what it is. It's just like I've got a. He works with me every day and has for ten years. Bradley, he's he's my my assistant engine builder here, and you know, we talk. He's a younger guy, and I talked to him. He's like twenty eight. I talked to him about this stuff, and I said, "Look, what you don't realize is." You're learning things that nobody else is learning. So, you know, in 20 or 30 or 40 years when nobody knows about a set of points and condenser and there's a historical vehicle out there that won't run and nobody can fix it, you can charge them whatever you want to because you know how points and condenser works. That's right? fair. That's so, real so, fair. Yeah. But that's only historical. I mean, that's why I have so many odd military vehicles and World War II stuff and all that. I mean, you know, and that's why I do a lot of work for, for Mr. Collier at my at, at, uh, Revs Institute. You know, you're always going to have that historical stuff that somebody can't just put a replacement power pack in out of a Tesla. You know, it, it, you're always going to have that. And there's going to be way more of that than there is people that know how to tune carburetors and set points. That's so. That's a fair point, and I think people who specialize in stuff like that, they have a real market going forward as long as they can find that niche, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, and if we ever have an EMP, that old stuff's the only thing that'll still run. 
Yep. <laughs> Get you away from the zombies. Yeah. yeah, those old those old mechanical those old mechanical diesel tractors will still be plowing fields while the brand new John Deere's are parked. So they, want, um, they need an update, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that just to me, a tractor just don't belong with any of that stuff. I know how tractors get get you know beaten, and I mean, the the tool that you always have on a tractor is a hammer because a hammer fixes anything on a tractor. Anything. Every tractor in the world has got a hammer somewhere on it. It may be strapped onto it. It may be stuck under the seat like it is on my tractor. But you've always got a hammer. You know, if it won't start, you go bang on the starter with a hammer and it'll start. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. wow i'm coming at this whole thing completely different from any of your other customers jake i'm telling you all right so, so jake, hold jake, on let, let, let me give let me give everybody a backstory on kurt okay so kurt <laughs> is he's in the he's in the old program but he is toward the end of the line and we just got his engine apart we thought it was scattered smothered and covered we thought it was grenaded from end to end, it's the M9701 38 Carrera S. We thought it was trashed and um, pulled it apart. And I learned that he just had the clutch replaced. They used a performance clutch of uh, unspecified origin and said clutch was slipping tremendously for several reasons. It built up a ton of heat and it actually completely melted the second mass of the flywheel. And then it uh, went through the back of the engine there to the to the rear main bearing, and it smoked the rear main bearing and got a lot of metal in the oil, and it almost grenaded. But all the excess heat was his failure. All well, the rest of the engine looked fine inside. So, Kurt, from from that, tell us what you think. <laughs> well, you know, you guys, you talk about like uh, COVID stories and things like this, right? Now, the whole reason I have a Porsche 911 is because I'm six foot five and I tried to sit in a Corvette. I couldn't fit. You know, it looked cool. And, you know, I was finally getting some means, putting my kids through college. They get off the payroll. I sit in a 911. Holy crap. This is the greatest car ever. I don't even drive with the seat all the way back. It's got three pedals. I love a stick shift. I don't know crap about motors or whatever, but man, when I hammer down, I go. All right. So I joined the PCA, start going on drives. Um, COVID hits. It's like, okay, now what I'm what am I gonna do? Well, I went on uh this uh this rally in the Smokies. Um guy had a car like mine, sounded really cool. Had hit and I asked him, it's like, why does your car sound different than mine? And he popped open the, the back um, and I looked in there and it's got these crazy lampshade looking things. And I thought, well, that's pretty neat. Well, I've just got this like box in mind. Um, he's like, yeah, this is where the air comes in. Oh, okay. So um, it's COVID. So I thought I got, you know, itchy fingers. Maybe I can go and buy one and put it on the car. And I happen to have a friend who's uh, like a lot of you guys are DIYer. I mean, he loves telling how he takes a uh, uh, LS motors and rebuilds them. And, you know, he's taking a El Camino that he bought for 2,500 bucks, spending 15 grand on it, to turn it into an autocrosser, whatever that is. Anyway, so fast forward a little bit. I think, okay, maybe I'll get a set of tools. Um, I got some new mufflers because... I did the research. I check on these companies. I can get 15 horsepower more. And who doesn't want more of anything, right? I don't know what it means. So, okay, let's put new mufflers on. So I did that. Uh, and I needed a new starter. So my buddy Rob helped me put a starter on. Well, it's starter sort of hidden in the car. So we took a bunch of crap off of it. And you had to reach down and... And do all this and uh, replace a wire. And I figured while that was off, GT3s are cool, right? Supposedly they have a throttle body that makes your car go faster and a, a plenum that's pretty and silver and aluminum colored. So got all that, put it all on there. Then the clutch goes bad. And uh, it just started to slip. I drove it home and took it to the local Indy shop. They are a Porsche racing shop. 
and uh, he put the new clutch on and seemed okay. I drove it easy for 500 miles. I have a, a convertible. So did I smell anything? Well, it's a new clutch, like new brakes. It's supposed to smell, right? Plus Porsche smell anyway. Everybody loves the smell of flat sixes in the morning. I don't know crap about it. You know, I thought, well, maybe I'll change my own oil. Um, so I bought a, a quick check. I got some tools that like the 10 millimeter, whatever socket wrenches, those are supposed to be important. Um, and I got some things so I could take my wheels off and I bought some new wheels, didn't even have the tools to replace them. So I got this quick jack in it. So anyway, this is a really long story, Jake, but uh, I'm going to be similar probably to some of your customers in the sense that I didn't know crap about cars or this car. Um, I got the new clutch. I was super stoked about it. I couldn't really hear the car making funny noise, you know, good noises until like 6,000 RPM or whatever. And so I'd shift at the red line and, you know, I'd take it to the Smokies <laughs> and drive in rallies. And I love adrenaline. I know crap about cars, but I tried to learn, right? Then I was, uh, well, I was, you, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you know, now you're really learning because you're yeah, in the, in right. the flat six owners lounge. Right. So you guys that are, you guys that rate to be in a lounge that you bought your right. engine from us, um, Again, don't try to fly under the radar because I'm going to bust you and kick you out. But if you really rate to be there, you get to learn a lot. And, and I, I put exactly. tech stuff in there all the time. I go live all the time. I'll just be sitting here or I'll be down at the flow bench or something. I'll find something. I'll go live. Or when I found out what was going on with Kurt's engine, I go live in that group. You learned about it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that's the key, you know. And, and this stuff is not hard. You guys have got it made, you know, with with YouTube videos and being able to do that. Right. I mean, when I was a kid, most of us, obviously, when we were kids, there was none of that. But I didn't have, you know, I had to go blow it up to learn about it, literally. I, um, I took a Polaroid camera to my 1971 Beetle when I had to rebuild the drum brakes. <laughs> and I just knew as long as I could go backwards and put everything back together the same right. way, it should work. Yeah. And see, okay. like, I got this old book. Photos. <laughs> see, this old book, How to Keep Your Honda ATC Big Red Alive. So I've got a, I've got a, I, I like three wheelers. I got a bunch of them. And so, so I got this book because it's from 1986 and it's cool. And they it's should, written by, they, they should you know, know, write a book on how to stay alive on a yeah, big exactly. red. Well, <laughs> Those things are great for my business. <laughs> that's, just, that's just, but you see, the thing is, it's like that, you see that meme, it's like, it, it says skills, and it's a, a like a four-wheeler, and it says, you know, uh, better skills, and it's a dirt bike, and it says expert skills, and it's a trike, you know? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> well, I mean, the, and the crazy thing is, the whole reason you have my car, Jake, is because my damn convertible top stopped working. And I tried to fix it myself and it, it didn't work. And so I took it to the local independent guy who put my clutch in. And, uh, you know, he, I said, well, while you have it, just change the oil too. It's a pain in the ass when I did it. So he's like, okay. And then he sends me a picture of this like shiny stuff in the oil filter. I was like, what's the big deal about that? He said, you got an issue, man. Uh, You're making gold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but the thing is, car. the thing is, he's the one that caused the issue. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I and the the way I found you is probably like a lot of people do. I got on the internet and I thought, okay, well, I could save money and have it redone to stock. Or this guy quoted me up to rebuild my motor, uh, and then I found some people in Florida that would do it for something, something. And then I start looking around and it's uh flat six innovations. Okay. That seems pretty cool. And so I did the research and um, reached out to you guys and you got on, you got on the phone with me. So did Judd answered a bunch of questions. And he said, you need to decide now because we're making some big changes. And I think I got in just under the gun. Um, and, uh, but man, I want to tell you something, Jake and Judd and everybody else who's listening, you guys have taught me so much and I'm so looking forward to getting my car back, not just to drive it. All right. But to take care of it for the next 25 or 30 years or however, however long to, know what it is I'm doing and how the internal pieces of it work. 
I mean, it's fascinating. And this has been a huge education. Dude, I don't know a crankshaft from a water cooler reservoir or whatever. <laughs> nothing. All right. <laughs> like literally nothing. Hell, I was a history major, you know, um, this hasn't been my thing. I had four little kids that I was raising. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that there's so much more to being in flat six innovations and now L and N and it's the education for those of us who have the enthusiasm, but none of the knowledge that we haven't grown up with it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we're going to keep that, you know, I mean, as, as this program kind of transforms, we're keeping that because I'm taking tons of video of these engines and, and, and 300 pictures of this thing going together um, more so than we've ever really done before. I treat this like it's one of what I call a, a superstar customer. That's a guy who wants every picture of everything. And we have some of those. So I'm like, let's document everything here. I'm going to give this guy photos that, that he will never even know what they are. He's never going to ask for them. He's not going to know, you know anything about this, but he gets it. And it also documents everything for us. So, um, you know, we're going to continue doing that. And, and of course, Judd doing what he's doing with supporting those engines at, with his new role at LN. And then of course, when people buy the engine, they get to go in the engine owner's lounge and I still plan to be there. I'm pulled myself away from most everything else, but the owner's Lounge is a place I'm still going to be, um, you know, awesome. because I like it there. I, I like it there. I like that. I, I like what we've created with you guys because it went from something that was really not even attended to something that's got post every day. Um, and you guys are getting together. You know, we, somebody told me this the other day. They're like, you know what? You didn't even try to create this image or any of this stuff. It's but look community. at what you've done. Yeah, the community. I never tried to do that. And it just shows what can be done if you focus on the important things. And the important things are not building the image and not building the community. If you build that foundation of all the things on the bottom side of things that make it work and make it be respected and make it be something that that has depth and it has width if you do that then people will appreciate what you create and want to share it with you that's a quote from dr porsche right so with that that's what's built the community you guys built the community i didn't big... um, but we just we just had that foundation and then people want to be a part of it and they want to be a part of it multiple times like mark's got several engines abe's got several engines um you know i've i've built Honda Odyssey or Honda Pilot engines for Abe for his ATV, um, you know, uh, did a Polaris Razor engine for him. I mean, all kinds of weird stuff that 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 I normally wouldn't do unless I'm doing it for myself because I just love building anything. Um, but that's what we've created, and and that's something that people, you know, you just don't get it. And when you get when you look at Renlist, you see just exactly the opposite. You see a community divided. You 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 look at that, and it is just as divisive as politics, right? Because you've got yeah. two sides over there, a very specific two sides, and they never it, it parts the aisle, man. That's it. You got the you got the guys that go with Z bomb, and the guys that go with Raby. That's it. You know, I've never even. I and think and I what gets me is the Z bomb. The Z bomb guy doesn't even have a freaking M ninety six engine in his car, but he knows everything about one. So I don't know why he didn't get one. I, um, I think the you know best he knows part... everything about a dyno. Go ahead, go ahead, Jake. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's fine. That guy more about dyno jet dyno than anybody at dyno jet did. So you might want to hire him over there. <laughs> man, oh man. well just to go off what kurt was saying um he doesn't consider himself very mechanically knowledgeable right i'm getting there but, <laughs> yeah but at the same time he's enjoying learning right and i think right. for the people who find themselves mechanically inclined or at least want to be you provide that knowledge to them too mm -hmm. and i think it's it's a nice trade-off where you can not only learn something but trust in what's happening in the process because you know what's happening and i think that's what kurt felt from the side of i don't know a whole lot but i trust these guys right and it me as trust. yes yeah me as someone who learned to work on cars because i had to 
because I couldn't afford for someone else to work on them when I was younger. Um, and now I'm all about it. Yeah, I will totally pay someone to fucking work on my car. Like, please, please work on my car. I don't yeah. I don't want to spend the time doing this. I've got other things I have to do. Um, but at the same time, it's like the melding of that, right? It's like you're providing the knowledge so that people can do this if they want to. And at the same time, at least you understand what's happening. I mean, and, it's and fun. that's the reason fun. I was going to say, that's the reason why I want to do and I'm trying to get scheduled now when to do it. An engine owner's class, right? For guys like Kurt, you know, for guys that that want to learn how to do this stuff on their own. I've been doing classes since 2007 for Porsche engines. Most of those were internal classes of building engines, but they were aimed and geared toward a different person. You know, I want to do classes because now we've got hundreds and hundreds of people that have our engines. I want to do a class that's like, okay, here's how you change your oil. And here's how you yes. look at your oil. Do you do you find the gold in there? You know, you cut the filter open. Um, you, you know, you pay attention to things while you're underneath there. You you have your head on a bit of a swivel. You have good uh, understanding of is something leaky? Uh, is your coolant tank yellow? Has it got a crack in it? You know, all those little things that people uh, just overlook because that's totally. the thing. You and know that's, that that's the thing that, that you really uh, see, Kurt. I'm the other side of the spectrum from you. When I drive a car, I am sensory overload, right? Because I know what makes it tick to the point that is obsessive. So I'm going down the road and I'm paying attention to everything all the time, right? Like so it's not even fun sometimes because I'm driving and I'm wondering what's that noise? What's that smell? What's going on here? What's going on there? It had a little bit of a hiccup at you know a third load. I mean, all this crazy stuff. Now it's great with what we're doing for test work, but when every car you drive, you treat it that way, it gets old yeah. because you know yeah. so much about it. You and I do the same thing when I'm in a when I, in a helicopter or an airplane. You know, what's that smell? What's that? What's that? Because I crewed helicopters, so you got to always be on your game because well, you might need that one second. So <laughs> you know, you you know just enough because if you know too much. That drives your hypersensitivity disorder, which drives people crazy. <laughs> well, yep. and anybody who's successful in business, you know, that we have our own our own areas of expertise where people have to trust us to take care of them in our area of expertise. But man, when I change the oil in my car the first time, you're going to love this. And this is why I'm coming to your class. <laughs> I went to AutoZone. I bought the oil change like jar thingy, the big pan with the <laughs> lid on it where the Everything drops yeah. out. I burnt the crap out of my hands at first. So I waited a while, then drained the oil out like I was supposed to do. And it didn't go down on the pan. It went all over my garage floor. I was like, you what didn't the you hell? didn't take the you, the you didn't take the thing out of the center of it. The the thing. I couldn't thing. even see it. <laughs> From what I've found, the, the the trick to changing oil is to wear a shirt that you care about. <laughs> and all of a sudden right oh man and so that and lesson you're, learned... you're guaranteed you're guaranteed <laughs> to get oil everywhere but if you wear was... something in the intent of changing oil surgical precision it's it's perfect yeah <laughs> well, i uh i that was a good lesson and it hasn't happened again so but that's you know i'm a big believer in lessons learned and um that's one I've learned so many lessons in this program and I am so excited to get my car. And, you know, I've told you, Jake, I totally trust you and, you know, just build me a car that works and it's fun to drive. Um, yeah, and, well, uh, well, that's what we're looking for. Well, uh, I've got, I got something cooking, so it'll be a lot <laughs> like Abe's. That's what, that's what I'm going to do. Cause I've got the, cool, cool, I've got cool. the parts and I can make it a lot like his and, you know, you've got to have a crank. We've got that. I've got that handled, I believe. So we'll figure that out. So it's that's all awesome. good. It's awesome. All right, so yeah, um, well, I'm going to jump so in here now, and say one thing, Jake, if you don't mind. That? Yeah, um, one thing that I've always loved about Jake is that, contrary to popular belief, he really does care about the do-it-yourselfer. And when we met almost five years ago, he was uh, already doing classes, but we had a lot of discussion about going a step further by doing Renvision. We started Renvision on YouTube which is free for most, uh, all the content on there. Most of the content is free. And of course, if you want a little more advanced content, you can become a member and access some different things that are 
that are exclusive to membership. But I just wanted to go ahead and, and because we have some questions on YouTube, Jake, I want to ask you, um, most of you guys here in the owner's lounge probably have seen this. This is something that Jake and I spent more than a year planning and producing. It's the M9X engine assembly. And if you're planning, I, I know a lot of folks cannot afford to have Flight 6 Innovations rebuild their engine. And they may not even be able to get an independent shop locally. So a lot of the, of the guys are, are tackling this job themselves. And so what Jake and I did a few years ago is we started planning to do a step-by-step -step assembly of the M9X engine. It was a major undertaking. And guys, you talk about learning something as a guy. Hey, I'm a, I'm a normal guy too, right? I looked at this when I arrived at Jake's research facility, and I saw this engine in a million pieces. I got, oh my God, <laughs> what have I got myself into? But the cool thing is that if you just start looking at all the trees in the forest, you'll just be overwhelmed. But the cool thing about this series, even if you're not even planning to rebuild the engine, if you want to learn all the inner workings of the Porsche in the M9X, this series will show you everything you know. Jake breaks it down step by step by step by step. 20 videos it took to do it, 20 stages it took to produce this series. And of course, he followed up with a workbook for those who prefer to have something in written form. But I, I just say, I learned a lot on Renlist and I've learned a lot, you know, coming through YouTube. But when I actually got to be that fly on the wall, so to speak, and just watching Jake break this thing down. I understand why his classes have been so successful, but I know a lot of folks can't do the hands-on classes and they can't afford to go through the program. So we, we produced this series and I think it's the best option that is out, out there for the do-it-yourself. Well, I was going to say in, in the last class that I had, and I just, I just did one for March, uh, a hands-on engine rebuild class. It sold out in like two days um, as soon as people found out about it, it was sold out, and I haven't done one since COVID started. So uh, the last one that I did, we had just finished those videos, and I seriously used the video for half the class. And after doing that, that's what I want to do from now on is the whole class just to take the video and then go just just really kind of expand on the video. Because I used to sit there and use PowerPoint, and you know, as General Mattis said, PowerPoint makes us stupid, right? Um, and it was so boring. This way, I would – I'm actually sitting here in my presentation room right now at the training center. But I would turn on the video, like an hour of it, and I would just walk out of the room. And then I would come back in 30 minutes, and I'd stop the video. Okay, let me answer questions. And then I'd go back out for another 30 minutes and then once they did that work once they watched the video we would go downstairs and do that work and then we came right back upstairs watched the next segment and then went back downstairs and did it and it worked better than anything ever has before because it showed everybody all they needed to see but it kept out all the fluff that they didn't need to see and then when they went to go do the work it connected the dots so the video is epic and in, in all of those ways well, there's um, a, my background is a, a lot of you guys don't know this. I, my background is in structural technology. And so we love implementing technology to help people because not everybody's going to, you know, listen to a lecture and be able to absorb the information. We have to have it in different forms, right? Simulation, uh, video, sometimes we write it down. Uh, we actually have to learn by doing, actually getting our hands on on and working with it and it starts to make sense to us but what jake was just uh describing reminds me of a new learning theory it's called flipping the classroom and uh, a lot of universities are doing this now where you actually watch the content before you get into the class so to speak so you watch it it's kind of like it's kind of like when the teacher used to say read chapter two before we meet but this way, it's, it's you actually watch what we're going to discuss, and then and then Jake comes in there, and it starts to discuss what you just watch, and then you actually go and do it. So it, it another learning theory is called constructivism, 
And that's basically learning by design as you're building that engine and you're in immersed in and instruction with Jake and you actually see the videos, all those different things pull together and you come out, at least in my opinion, you'll come out knowing how to build one of these engines. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I was able to use that series to, you know, rebuild the Boxster motor, which was, you know, going to be the one that I would practice on before doing the 911. But then, you know, my uh, choice changed. And there's been other guys that have posted on RenList that have used that DVD series and been able to follow it and rebuild their motors. Yeah, it's happened That's a lot. It's yeah. It's not just a book. That's the thing, right? You get I, to see hands on what's going on. And Jake is Jake hates engineers as a term, I think. I, I think that's an accurate description. Yeah. Uh, but uh but but he is an engineer. I, I'm I'm an engineer by schooling. Um I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself a classical engineer, but at the same time, like uh I get the if I can hear it and see it at the same time, I can replicate it. Right. And like, so that's, that's what the series is, is that it's, it's, you're seeing it, you're getting the knowledge from it and why you're doing it this way all at the same time. And it, it helps everyone understand it. Someone who's a visual learner, someone who can just hear it and see it, someone who needs to know why we're doing this. It's all there. Well, so. and the other thing is that I based the book from the video, not the other way around. So yeah, totally. we actually use that. We, we transcribed the video and that was the, the base text of the book. So it worked out really good. So something that I have not done before, but I'm going to be doing it with Mark. We need to get to Mark here in a second. But Mark's bought several engines from me. He and his wife have been very active purchasers for years. Uh, I've done work on his turbo. Um, I mean, we've done a little bit of everything except for for him, except for working on something air cooled. Um, but he and his wife want to attend a class with me as a one on one, and that's something that I'm that I'm going to do limited, obviously. But I have not done that before, um, and we're going to wait a little bit later in the year. I've got to get my schedule together. He has to get a few more parts, uh, Mark. Tell them, tell them kind of your story a little bit because your story is is deep. I mean, you you know you've got what three or four cars now that have you got you're building an engine and you got three other ones and yeah, all I've kinds got, of stuff. I got five nine ninety sixes. I've got a 01 C two. I've got a 01 turbo. I've got a 02 cab. I've got a 02 uh, C two, and I've got a 03 C two and the uh, I first met Jake right after I bought my 01 C2. I took it to him to see about getting the IMS uh, IMS bearing done in it and uh, some other just preventive work just right after I bought it. I, I actually wanted a solution at that time, but they didn't have a solution for the uh, uh, double row bearing. So I got the regular. Uh, the retrofit bearing. And then uh, after that, I had bought a turbo and uh, I actually let a friend of mine test drive it and he blew the, one of the coolant tubes out of it <laughs> up, in, yeah. up in Michigan, it's which was 800 common, miles from home. Yeah, so, it's a very common problem with the turbo models. Yeah. Uh, so, a lot uh, of people yeah. have posted on the forums about those coolants. Uh, pipes uh, busting out so yeah uh, i know tony callis and a lot of the the big shops have found a way to pin those uh ends there to keep them from popping yeah out. well that's that's what i ended up doing i actually my wife drove i bought the car and while i was working up in michigan i live in tennessee and my wife drove the car up and then i let a friend of mine up there drive it and he popped one of the coolant tubes out so I uh, bought about five hundred dollars worth of tools and stuff up in Michigan, and did a temporary repair. And I actually shipped the car back down here and shipped it, had it, and took it down to Jake. And uh, I talked to him about doing a, a major service on it, and uh, took the car to him. He did a major service on it and uh, pinned the coolant lines and stuff. And so we. Uh, 
we've we built a relationship on that back in 2015 2016 and my wife uh i got the turbo and it was dark blue and the c the 2001 c2 was silver my wife said well you know if you get a blue car it's mine <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the spring of 18 i found a 2003 c2 that was midnight blue with a with a black interior with a excuse me with a gray interior and uh, i bought i bought that i drove it home and i dropped the engine transmission out of it put an ims solution in it an aos a water pump a bunch of other stuff uh put it back together and we drove that for a while and uh then I I talked to Jake some and I'd seen you know some of his engines and I I really wanted uh, to to fix the 2003 for long term reliability and so on and I said well you know I want the forged rods and I want the forged pistons and all that and I just talked to Jake and said well I'd just like to see about getting one of your engines and so we set up the deal and I got the uh, got in line for a, a four liter stage two track performer motor back in, uh, I guess it was what, to get uh, delivery in 2021, summer 2021. And uh, <clears throat> so I had taken the car down and given it to him. And, and well, I was taking the car down and give it to him in 20, early, early 2021. And uh, I was working on a project up in Michigan and it got extended. And I said, well, if I got to spend another summer in Michigan, I'm going to get a convertible. <laughs> <laughs> and just so happened, I found a convertible with, that Jake had that had the 3.8 liter stage one motor. And I said, well, let me come and look at it. Of course, I came and looked at it and drove it home that day. And uh, <clears throat> took it up to Michigan. I bought it in uh, late October, and then in the, it stayed in Tennessee for the winter, and then I uh, took it up to Michigan in the spring, and I got about 1,000 miles on before I left to go to Michigan, and I drove 10,000 10, miles up in Michigan that summer. I didn't have the top up once all summer long. I had a garage at my apartment, so I just parked it in the garage, and I just drove it all, all every weekend. Just, just It was so much fun. It ran so good. And then uh, the, two, the 2003, my wife's car got done and we got it. It's, it's, a, it's a real hoot to drive and, and so much fun. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, actually this, I bought a, uh, I bought a failed 3.6 motor uh, out of Jacksonville. Um, I was going to take it apart and learn how to do the motor because I always wanted to build a water-cooled motor. I've done a number of air-cooled motors, but I hadn't done a water-cooled motor, and I uh, wanted to do that, so I bought a motor. And then uh, about the time I retired last uh, April, I, uh, I found a 2002 roller. Uh, Nice straight body, looked to be pretty much complete, just minus the engine, had 200,000 miles on it. The kicker was it had a dark blue interior. So my wife liked that. So I got it, now I'm in the process. I took the bad motor I got, and we took it all apart and working on building a four liter equivalent of a flat six stage two motor. And uh, the past two weeks, I had to I've uh, been working on a project for my wife about taking all the dark blue interior out of that silver car taking the gray interior out of her blue car now her blue car has a dark blue interior and my silver roller has a <laughs> has a uh, a gray interior and I actually took the 3.8 liter out of the flat six motor out of the convertible and put it in the silver car and I'm going to put the four liter motor in the in the uh convertible yeah so it's like musical engines around there you know just swap them out 
<laughs> yeah, just don't tell don't tell the wife that you swapped them. You're good. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that's the wife's got the four liter stage two motor. <laughs> oh, oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, the well, wife men definitely let her know <laughs> what the what the wife wants. The wife gets <laughs> yeah. because the wife lets me have most whatever i want uh, happy wife happy life i hear you man. I, I have a i have a good <laughs> wife she uh she loves cars she loves guns she loves motorcycles <laughs> what else now, is I, there <laughs> now if i go to buy a gun she says well did you buy me one too so i was buying <laughs> i was buying firearms in pairs <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah you, mark's got a pretty long history here not not quite as long as abe abe had to leave i think abe's got maybe maybe about eight years on you something like that uh, yeah, so it's, it's been a real uh a real real good relationship and uh i found jake and flat six to be a very good group to work with and uh you know it always kills me i went i did a on rent list, they had the thing where somebody was setting up, a, I called it the Dragon Run at the 1st of December. And my wife and I actually went on that. And Z Bomb was, he was there. And uh, Aaron uh, goes to Jeeper, who put a GT3 engine in his 996 Mark.1. They were there. And they were, you know, they're, they're, they were nice people. And we had a good time. We drove probably. Uh, 400 miles that on saturday we uh actually went from the dragon all the way down to uh such as and uh 129 back up and and so on back up and back up into north carolina so we had a had a real fun uh fun trip and uh it was it was a real good a real good experience and it was so much fun in that my wife's car she let me drive her car and it was a <clears throat> it was so much fun because i could just run off and leave those guys all of them if i wanted to because it, it it runs so good it's just got so much so much torque and and such a broad broad power band it just it's a it's a just a a joy to drive That's yeah good too to bad hear. i'm a dragon too... rally guy man that is great to hear sorry jake I, okay. I've done like eight dragon rallies uh, down there. So I am really, really looking forward to it. And uh, thanks for saying that. that, all that oh, it's, can, it's great. And do the. You can, uh, you can stick it, in a single gear a lot longer. I'll put it that way. Well, you can. Well, and, 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 and you see, not everybody has a 4.4 liter, Josh. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. My, my 4.4 might do a little better. But, uh, but yeah, no, no, all of your engines, awesome. from what I've seen, have that nice flat torque curve that, uh, that really lends itself well to, especially like mountain driving, where mountain driving. you don't want to be downshifting and upshifting constantly. You want to be on the wheel. Yeah, I think that Josh could just have third gear. That's all he needs. Third gear, <laughs> third gear does everything. Third gear will, and that thing will pull from like twenty miles an hour to like one thirty yeah. or something. I mean that that's the only. Oh, gear I can't you need. wait! I can't wait! <laughs> oh, you you you're gonna love it. You're gonna love oh, it. Oh man! It, see, that's you know, that's one thing that gets me. It, it it goes back to this whole you know this division that we talked about. You know, and and it's not just rentless, but it's most rentless because that's where everybody's at. Um, that talks about it, and, and, and like I said, I banned myself from there, thank goodness, but I know how it used to be, and I know how Olivier and the guys that, that, that are that are on there for LN, they still tell me all the crap that, that, that's there, but it's the same crap, different story, same crap, different guy throwing it, uh, you know, it, it's always going to be that way, and people are going to do what they want to do if they don't get it, whatever it may be, they don't want the other guy to have it. And so they have to tear it down to make it less well, for whatever that's... reason, you know? So, I mean, is people call it jealousy, but I don't even call it that because to be jealous, you have to, I mean, that, that takes a town of a different bone. This is not jealousy. They either don't get it or they, sometimes they don't want it. Right. No, they, they just want to be important. A, yeah. They and want, they, they want to be the important one on the forum. Well, that's well, it. what gets me is they 
They want to hear themselves think. I guarantee you these guys go back and proofread their post after they post them because they want to see how cool it sounded. You yeah. know, th- that's Could the whole thing. Could I have edited that to make it sound their, a little better? Yeah. It's their internet <laughs> image, you know, and I see people go from one forum to another, or at least I used to. I, I left all that bullshit. I don't do any of it anymore. But I see, I would see people go from like 986 forum, which was the, the big one back in the day. They would learn something there, or they would go to Rentech. They go to Rentech, learn something there, and the same dude would go to 986 forum, and he would go post it over there like it was his own information. Like he he's the guy that did it, but they don't have any firsthand information. And that's the main thing that pisses me off about it is it's just constant regurgitation of miscommunication crap. And then people start to take it as the gospel. It's, it's just as bad as as, as me, the media is, you know, uh, with a lot of this stuff. But it's, it creates division um, that shouldn't even be there. Because I mean, I don't give a damn what those guys say. I never have. I I, I march to the to the beat of my own drum. Uh, you know, out here where I'm at, I don't I don't deal. With, I don't see anybody else. I don't have anybody else to please. Last time I checked, you know. I can build an engine that sells for 39, you know, for in 39 seconds. Um, so, you know, I think that's pretty valid as to what we've been able to create. And we've only been able to create it through a true representation of what it is. It is not some kind of fake image. And, and that to me is, is that, that is the, the validity. That's what gives you that that's, width and that depth. Because but that's it, what I, that's what I think everyone here appreciates about your work, Jake, is that um, it hasn't come from you placing high dollar ads somewhere. No, I, you I have think, you have created never, something and everyone has heard from someone else that this is what you want. You know, right. And it, it's not right. it's not advertising. It's not marketing. It's this is what you want. And then when someone else gets it, they go, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. Well, that organic, that that organic type of of old school, you know, reference and and validity is what nobody else has with this stuff. Agree. There, there's there's a, a race to the bottom, and and that race has gotten some new people joined into it. And I welcome them to the fray. Hey, it is what it is. There's th- these engines are failing at a rate that there's more than enough for everybody out there, and and it just allows the people that don't want what what we build to not even clog up the communication lines honestly yeah. that you yeah. know they, no, they know what else. we got you, you well, there's no the, reason you weren't for the them, customer we wanted anyways right well, there's so, no re- you know there's no reason for them to inquire see i don't want to make it like that like you're not the guy that i want i want to make it like i'm not the guy you wanted see Fair. That, that's a, that's a whole difference right Yep. What I do, where I'm sitting there with a j- just a, a device that measures to ten thousandth of an inch with one tool, it costs five thousand dollars to be able to measure that and document that on a on a spreadsheet or actually in an engine build log. If you want that, I'm your guy. But if you want somebody that's going to slap something together in a few hours and take pride in that, then you want that guy. You don't want me. It, it's just two different worlds, you know, and 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 there's always more than one way to skin a cat as we say here in the south and and with these engines there's a lot of ways to skin the cat the thing is i know how i skin the cat and i think that i do a more efficient job of skinning the cat um and you guys appreciate the way that i skin the cat so um and that's what matters to me because i have to tell you you know i get so just pissed off with seeing the daily communication and the daily things that in the degradation that we've seen with communication with people with with purchasers and with shops and everything so when i come in here and 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 i get a little bit of a pep rally from you guys right um it it makes it easier for me to go out and develop things because i know you guys are going to appreciate it so that's my role now is developing cool stuff and overseeing these engines being built it's no longer the guy selling it to you. So, um, I mean, now it, it just inspires me to go do even more uh, and and to to get more done and to to think of new things. Like I had two more thoughts tonight while I've been sitting here talking, um, one about a class and one about another part that I want to make. So, you know, it, it goes both ways. You guys energize me and then I energize you. 
And then those detractors that that are so divided, you know, they just need to go over there and do their own thing. And the fact that they don't proves how powerful this is of what we've created. And it's not just the engine, but it's the community. You know, when a guy that don't even have a Porsche engine in his car keeps on wanting to bring up what somebody should do with their Porsche powered car, that is proof that. What we have is contagious. The guy can say whatever he wants. He can hate my guts as much as he wants. His actions are proving that what we are doing is valid because he's spending time doing it. And like I've said, he's a guy keeping it at the top of the list. He's so dense, he don't even realize it. The, the guy's making posts on something that's two pages back, you know, on two pages back on win list, and he brings it back to the top. Well, he just he just advertised for the program. And he don't realize it. But what he says in his own mind is is so great that he wants to see it. So it, it's it's really it's a good and a bad thing. And it used to bother me, but it hasn't bothered me in a long time. You know, it really hasn't. Yeah. Hey, Jake, this is Fred. I've got a quick comment yeah. about yeah. about the owner's lounge and about the the forums. 986, Ren list, whatever. Uh, and this applies to Kurt, too, because there's people out there looking for information and they're trying to learn. OK, when I got the the uh, the three point eight liter back from you, I immediately pulled the bumper off, which I hadn't done before. And I removed my grill vents that I had that I had put in and done a lot of research on to get good <laughs> flow and stuff like that. But I wanted to get 100 percent flow based on your testing. So I, I pulled them out while I had it apart. I pulled the radiators apart. I'd had those grills in there for two years. And what I found was, was that between those two radiators, I still had way too much pulverized material right between the condenser and, and the radiator. And you made a comment to, and I, I posted the pictures on the, on the uh, owner's lounge. They're still in, you know, way back up in the thread. But anyway, we were talking, you and I on the on the in the owner's lounge, and you said, hey, you should put those out on the, you know, on the forums, the pictures. And because people don't believe this. And I said, no way, I'm not going to do it because <laughs> it's not worth the battle with these guys. OK, it's not. If you want to put grills in and reduce airflow and you're worried about, you know, getting huge rocks thrown up and stuff, go for it. But if you're putting grill guards in to think you're not going to have to clean your radiators and your condensers out, you're nuts. Okay. Well, I see, can tell you that yeah, it's a double, it's a, uh, But they don't believe it. They nugget. don't believe it. Well, you know? Hey, well, I cut it, mine it, off. It, I cut mine off before my car went to Georgia because, <laughs> I, because I learned. <laughs> I had, well, all, see, I had the, them all in there. The I problem learned. is, the problem is, Fred, there's another problem with that. A lot of people don't clean the grills, don't clean the radiators before they put the grills on. You see, no, I know. They just they just if put it that. on and they leave it dirty. Okay, that's one problem. And they've now they've diffused the air with a grill and they've still got the air blocked with the debris. The other group of people are the ones who do clean it out first and they think this is the last time I'll ever have to I do ever this. have to do it. Okay, that's because right. they put that grill in there and it's like a prophylactic fix like this thing is fixed this is a be all and people want to do that everybody wants to do the one thing that stops all the problems yeah it's and a I'll prophylactic you, it's a prophylactic the, with big holes though that's the problem <laughs> well, see that's the problem like, if hey people, i bought them because it, they were only 40 bucks and they added like five horsepower so yeah wow. <laughs> but they added weight they made the car heavier so, so this yeah. is the thing so and they also change your arrow characteristics but think about now. this. So when you have that and you have that mindset, if you don't have to touch it anymore, what these people don't know that I know is nothing mechanical is eternal, right? None of this is is fix it and forget it. It's not that way. If you if you see what we see, not just with not just with these cars, but with anything mechanical, a tractor, a helicopter, an airplane, I work on all kinds of stuff. You're never done. You're never done. Uh, it's always got to be maintained. It always has to be fixed. And the, a lot of times, the more you try to make it where it 
doesn't have to be touched anymore, the bigger the problems are. Classic example, guys would, you know, put like an electronic ignition in an old car that's supposed to have points. They put the electronic ignition in there. They set the time in one time. They never check it again. Then over time, things in the distributor wear, other things wear, the time in changes. But because they're not checking the points, they don't know it. Then the owner of an old Volkswagen melts his engine, melts a number three piston, and wonders why. Well, because the ignition timing was dead, because you thought that you could put this thing in it and forget it. Needless to say, smart guy like like most of us out there, keep a set of points in the glove box because we know those electronic ignitions fail and leave you on the side of the road. So I've had to take that electronic ignition out and replace it with a set of points on the side of the road to save my ass. So so that's the other part about it is people think they have this, this conception of, hey, I've cleaned this out. I'm done with it. I put this $40 grill in here. Now I never have to do this again. And that guy ends up popping a cylinder or popping a head because he has dirty radiators and don't know it. That's how that's how Abe got his Targa. His um, Targa had a cracked cylinder because the bumper was packed full of junk. I ended up with that car and I built it for Abe. That's exactly what happened to that car. Go ahead, Kurt. Can I can I find out on the internet like what points are and why they're important? Yeah. Yes. You know, initially, <laughs> just, contact just Google points. Google the word points. I'm sure you'll come up with a lot of stuff. Yeah, points, <laughs> points and condenser. Points, points and condenser. Points and Google condenser. Points and condenser. Right. It'll come. I it'll need come your up, class. <laughs> it'll come up next to carburetors. Okay. <laughs> Those are the things that the can that sits on top of the old motors. A carburetor. Yeah. yeah the exactly. one that. Hey guys, the one that <laughs> that gets the one that gets me that I have seen over and over and over and over and over over the years on Riddleist and some of these other forms is the the guy that who either stores a car or is driving the car with a battery that is already at its end of its life. They go out on a trip or they go out on the town for the night and they come out, key fob won't work, car's dead as a doornail. Can't can't get in the car. And if they can get in the car, they can't open the trunk, the frunk. Because why? Because the battery's dead. Okay, so then they say, well, I have to get to the uh, manual emergency cable. They can't get that because the, the, the key lug is in the front, and they can't get the tire off to get the fender well running off to get to the manual release cable. They tried a, a jump box on the, the little fuse box techniques, and that doesn't work. So it, it just is a nightmare. I've seen this story over and over and over. I tell people, look, Make sure you have a fresh battery. It's 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 one hundred and one driving a car one hundred and one. If you're going to store the car, you know I tell people locks are only good to keep the honest people out. If you're going to store the car, use a trickle charger or find. Uh, I even tell people, look, I, when I put my when I when I park my car in my garage, or something, I don't lock it. I have insurance. Lord forbid if someone steals it, you know it would hurt, but I'd get it replaced. But these people that store these cars, I can't tell you how many people I've tried to help. They'll store the car in, in, in a storage, lock it down, and they can't get access to the battery because the battery's gone dead. Then they can't get it towed because it's in front, right? And so it's like a nightmare for these guys to try to get the car out of storage because simply that I was like, can you get the door open? Can you get a locksmith? Can you get the door open? If you get the door open, we might be one step further. They can't get into the manual release cable. On and on and on it goes. It's just a nightmare, guys. Have Has anybody here heard a story about a dead battery in a Porsche? Oh, if yeah. It's just me. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no <laughs> you can, you can have everybody it. learns about the emergency release after or when they need it, and it's too late to put that emergency re release. Or you can use it, yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows yeah. that until it's too late. Well, the whole problem is just, have... the, the whole thing is just stupid. The whole, the whole system makes no sense because, you know, if you've got a dead battery, then, you know, you already are not going to be able to actuate an electric electronic lock which is one reason why i like the 99 cars like the 99 996 is because they're manual with that 
and the early boxers are manual in that regard. Yeah, so the you're not going to have that. You're not going to have that problem with those as long uh. as you can get the door open to get the car into the car. You're good. Um, so the whole system makes no sense to me. It, it uh, just, very it nice just of them to, to they oh, provide really? you with the little tweezers in the fuse box to pull out the little thing though. That was very smart. <laughs> <laughs> Long oh, we? the cable, both for the front and the throttle body. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the wife's car, we have a we have a 2015 <laughs> Macan F on top of my 997 that's uh that's flat six to five. Um on the Macan, we uh we had a couple days of negative forty degree weather here. Battery voltage dropped really low. Doesn't like cold weather. That's a thing. Went to crank the car. It lost communication with the gateway that talks to every other module in the car. So I could fire the car up with a jump up. Problem was, I have no heat. I have no AC. I have <laughs> no traction control. I have no defrost. I have nothing that's on the center console working. So finally, it, it warms up enough to where I can stand outside for more than about an hour at a time. Uh, and basically, there's three fuse boxes in the Macan. There's one in the, in the trunk. There's one on the driver's side, side and on the passenger on side passenger. of the dash. All right. Yep. Basically went through everything, yanked every fuse, and plugged it back in. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. I have a Durametric. I have all these tools. I can do other things. Just basically yanked every fuse and every relay I could find. Perfectly good once it was above 30 degrees and I could plug everything back in and voltage was okay. And boom, now I can run defrost and I can actually drive the fucking car. Like, wow. unreal. it's nuts. And it's, it's literally just, it's cold out. That was it. It was cold out. So. But well, what gets me too is that, you know, people that are fearful of having their car stolen will uh, wrap those manual release cables up to where people can't get to them, right? Because you don't want your car. Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> and it defies all logic because you, you screwed yourself. And yeah. <laughs> what I know this sounds crazy, but what they end up doing, have to break a window. Yeah. And yep. no, the, guy about... that, the guy that, the guy that, had a, a pretty good YouTube channel before I met Jake was Ben Burner. He yeah. had a, a box. No. He ended up trying to destroy the front hood, trying to get into there. I, I it, it was painful to watch the video. Honestly, I, I just, there, <laughs> I can't well, watch see, it. You, I could not about, watch him destroy I, I was, a car trying to get into the front. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> you know, th think about this, talking about the electric cars, Josh, think about, that negative 40 if you had an electric car okay yeah. it wouldn't even oh no doubt them. oh that's the thing we've we've actually got a couple of supercharger stations here which is weird to me just because there's not a lot of electric cars in general right and the reason why is because negative 40 negative 50 degrees is not uncommon here i'm in montana i'm not i'm not in the middle of Ooh. nowhere i'm in a i'm in a pretty reasonably sized city in Montana. Um, so we have, and, and we're near ski resort. So we have a lot of, you know, people with money. So we do get a lot of, we get a decent amount of people with Teslas. It's rare to see a, a fancy car here. I'll be fair. But, but yeah, batteries don't do well in cold weather. It's just a fact. Like that's, that's not what they're designed to do. So even if you have a fully charged electric car, whether it's a Tesla or a Ford or whatever it is, you should expect like 30% of your mileage that you'd normally get out of that battery. That it just is what it is. That's that's what temperatures do. And so think people about, don't necessarily understand that, you know. Well, think about this. And don't get me wrong, I like Teslas. I do like them. I, I have nothing against them other than the fact they're electric, right? <laughs> but but I like the concept. But just for certain applications, not for everybody out there with every car on the road. I think that's the mistake. But just imagine if you had every car in your town in Montana, Josh, and they were all electric. Oh, they'd be, and, okay, they'd be, but, they'd be screwed. <laughs> but this is the thing. So then there's a – it's snowing. A tractor trailer gets sideways. It takes out the entire interstate, okay? Mm -hmm. Now – you. 
hundreds of these cars that are backed up with electric heat going, okay? Their heaters are electric. The car is sitting there. It already is cold as hell. Most of them are not going to be fully charged when they get there. How long is it going to take before these people start oh. freezing to death in their cars? No, a thousand percent. And we had that recently. That was uh, a month and a half ago. Um, they had to close down I-90 between Bozeman, where I live, and Livingston, which is basically the next exit past the pass when you go over the mountain. Um, they close it down pretty regularly for severe winds because it'll blow semis basically into other lanes um but it was so cold and so much ice on the road that people were just sliding off right is so, that when jeremy renner went and uh took his snowcat to get people out i jeremy. wish i <laughs> wish but no he was he was in uh Tahoe. the good part of that but <laughs> he was but, uh, <laughs> but yeah no this is a pretty normal occurrence here good you know Lord. and we just deal with oh. it well, so be, you can have the flip flop of that. Though. Okay. So, so just imagine Savannah, Georgia. Okay. There's one major thoroughfare. Well, you got I 95 that goes, goes up the coast and down the coast. But there's one way to get inland fast from Savannah, yep. and that's I 16, the only way. Okay. So, uh, when, a, when a hurricane is heading straight towards Savannah, everybody's got electric cars. Everyone's okay. there. Everyone's heading west. Yep. Exactly. So then all of a sudden, boom. There, it, there's always traffic on I-16. There's crashes left and right. So there's a crash. The interstate gets shut down. Now you've got all these cars sitting there. The batteries are dying. It's 100 degrees outside. They're running the air conditioning. The batteries yep. die. And now what happens to those people? The hurricane gets them because they're sitting in their cars. Yeah. Yeah. No, a thousand percent. That's it's it's crazy. Um, those aren't road and that's, cars. Yeah. To be fair. To be fair. I have a 997 with a 4.4 liter Raby engine. I drive it in negative 30, 40 degree weather. I'm good. And it's Sumabor. That's the other yeah. thing. That's We're testing Sumabor in negative 30 right now. So J Josh has one of the only Sumabor M96s. Actually, there's two in existence. There's, there's Josh's and there's the one that's in Lake Speed's Boxster. Lake Speed Junior's boxed, or the other ones are test engines, but those two are actually in service. So, you know, we've been doing this stuff for a long time, and I, I'm I'm great. I'm really really grateful that you're able to test that Sumabor in that crazy temperature. Yeah, absolutely. And it's as far as I'm concerned, I treat it like a car. Mm -hmm. The car I want to drive. Don't get me wrong. The car I really want to drive, but at the same time, it's just a car, and so I'm going to drive it. It's cold out. Yeah, I got snow tires on it. Let's drive it. And that's what I do every fucking day. Like yep. that's awesome. It's, it's so awesome. Yeah. As we're, we're, we need to wind down here, but we need still need to hear from a couple folks. So uh John and Joby and um I don't know if our Armando and, and Michael want to jump in. They had their video off, maybe they're just watching. But Joby, you've had your car for a few years now and you've been living with the whole uh republic of california um yeah. you know breathing down your throat oh, wait. i'm still holding out hope for you <laughs> make me something to replace this oh, that's great <laughs> well yeah. you know the problem is and there's nothing saying that i couldn't make it because those cats that are carb approved are they're 10 inches long and it just doesn't package well. It's going yeah. to change all those characteristics. And, they, and they're also, instead of being two and a quarter inlet and outlet, they're two and a half inlet and outlet. So, you know, that's not really sized properly for your engine output. It might, yeah. it'll work really good on Josh's 4.4 uh, or Imran's R43, but it won't really work well on yours. So, you know, there's some other options that I've been playing with because you're not the only one that's in that boat, you know. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing about more about that uh, that you know, that intake solution that you you came up with. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. But overall, um, the car's been great. I mean, you saw the um, the recent smog test. I mean, it was a damn near partial zero emissions vehicle with the uh, the NOx and the um, the hydrocarbons. So I couldn't have been happier with how it's it's broken in. And I, you know, I I'm like Josh. I drive it. It's been raining cats and dogs out here and. Car handles just fine in the rain. 
and uh, you know windshield wipers work so it's car so we drive it and it's it's just a ton of fun to drive no matter what heck i even have a bike rack on top of it i put my mountain bikes on it to go over and go to, to the local trails well, that's what I like because I like that you guys are are driving these things and putting real mileage on them, and you're exercising them because it, it. That's one thing that drives me crazy now about building air cooled engines, is because I build it and the guy never drives it. I mean, it's it just sets around and it becomes a garage decoration, you know, and it, it drives me crazy. And then when he does drive it, something happens because it hasn't been exercised, you know. Uh, so so I like it when they get when they get driven and they like it when they get driven, you know, especially every day. And that's one reason I like with the storage thing in the owner's lounge, I brought all that up and I'm like, just drive the damn thing. You know, yeah. you're, you're viewing it a bigger disservice mechanically by storing it. than you are with the body and the chassis by storing it and keeping it out of the environment. I mean, you're better off to uh, drive the thing and then, and then freaking wash the bottom of it and decontaminate it when you're done than it is to let it set up for six or eight months and not drive the damn car. Well, we well, don't, we don't, don't have salt up here. Yeah. We don't have salt up here, but at the same time, like I can tell a difference when I let it sit for three days, you know, versus just like driving it to work. Just, just fucking drive it. You know? Exactly. And, and, and Jake, I wish, uh, I wish I'd had the suspension uh, settled it before I sent it out to you. Cause you would have loved the way it handles. I, Pulled it up on jack stands and then changed all the suspension out to elephant racing stuff. And it is, it's just low key track ready device. And it's just, it looks like a, you know, a stripper 99. And yeah. I, I just love it. That That's awesome. I mean, because it's a lightweight, nimble 99. It, they're, they're the best cars. They really are to me. And especially from a do it yourself perspective. That is the best car, man, because the thing is, it's really no more complex than a 993. And in some ways, a 993 mechanically is more complex than a 996. So, you know, I think that that's the, 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 the best car. And guys all the time send me a thing. Hey, here's a 99 you might like. I know you want a white one with a gray interior. Yeah, but it's not blown up. I'm not going to buy a Porsche <laughs> that runs. I've never bought a Porsche in my life that runs. Why the hell am I going to buy one that runs? Makes no sense. I want one with a rod through the block. You know, I don't, that's, that's what I want. So, um, to be fair, that's what I got from you. And I appreciate it. That was, yeah. So Josh, <laughs> Josh, got this nine, nine, done, so. Josh got this 997 because it blew up at mid Ohio. I think it blew up and it, it was freaking scattered. There's a video, Bobby, that video that we did. The not the uh, M97 on track failure from like three or four years ago. Oh yeah, that was Josh's original engine. Remember when you came here and it was freaking oh, just yeah. obliterated? That, that was, was his unreal. Person. Yeah, that was unreal. And if you was guys have seen that video, you need to pull it up on YouTube. I, that the one I think the, the only thing that wasn't uh, annihilated on that engine was the IMS bearing. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so so to, to end things here because it's eleven o'clock here in the east. So. John, you've got a pretty, you've had a hell of a lot of ups and downs with your car, not the engine, even though in the beginning we had all those weird electrical problems, you know, an alternator made John's car come back and it was an odd thing because it wasn't doing it all the time. But these cars are voltage sensitive. If you don't have the right voltage, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And, and there's a lot of things that can lead to that. You can have corrosion, bad connections, a weak alternator, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. And then he got the car back from us and he drove the pants off of it. And then he had suspension work done. And, and now I guess the power steering's giving you a problem. Um, but kind of take us through a little bit of that because the main thing with you is you're a poster child for why you don't take these cars to a race shop. And, yeah. and the same, the same thing with Kurt, the same thing. So when guys own a Porsche, when they see a shop that says something racing, and it says if it's got a Porsche crest and it's got racing, they they're attracted to it like a magnet. If they are motorsports, they see that motor in sports. motorsports. Yep. Okay, <laughs> and, and Josh sees this in what he does. It, the thing is, I've tell I've talked about this over and over and over again. Those guys, and I'm uh, it's a big blanket statement, and there are exceptions to the rule, but as a general rule. They need to stick with corner balancing and brakes and suspension setup and alignment 
and putting in these cool little data loggers and putting in these cool cameras and making you think you're a race car driver. That's what they need to do. They need to leave engines alone. But you've even had a problem with those guys with suspension stuff. I mean, I'm, I, you, you sent me that, and I'm like, dude, you could have took the car down here to a guy I know that works on bulldozers, yeah. and he would have done a better job working on the suspension of that car than the race shop you took it to. Yeah, it's um, it was a, it was a weird. Well, first I gotta say that uh, thank you, Jake, for for being a man of your word and standing up and taking care of my car when it came back to you. Um, uh, Jake did me a serious solid when my alternator decided to convert to a twenty four volt system. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I met a, a gentleman uh, when I was at Petit Le Mans, uh, owned a race car shop. Uh, you know, uh, he and I got talking about suspension and he's like, oh yeah, you know, if you're going to do this, I really want to, want to take it on. And, and I've been doing this 20 years and, you know, I'll, I'll treat you right. Blah, 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 blah. And the shop is, I mean, Jake knows the shop. It's, it's a well-known shop here in the Metro Atlanta area, uh, supposedly has a great reputation. Uh, they put my suspension together without, uh, isolators, without top hat washers. They broke bolts off and left them broke. They... <laughs> Uh, left a sway bar bracket missing. Uh, they, they had the alignment. Uh, I think uh, in the front, uh, one side was on the toe was positive 0.25 degrees. And then on the other side in the front, it was negative 1.17. Um, and they had like the, uh, the that car tried to steer in the street, man, like let alone a track. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. then now, now Kurt's sitting over here like, I need to get you my business card. So when this thing crashes, exactly. <laughs> oh, it tried to, it tried to steer. Holy it, crap! It, the bump steer in the rear was so bad. It literally, when you're going around the corner, if you hit a bump, it would literally try and steer in two different directions at the same time. It was horrible. <laughs> um, I, I got, I got lucky and and uh, found a shop that was able to. Uh, take it all back apart and assemble the suspension correctly and fix all the, you know, they left one of the brake line retaining brackets completely unbolted from the car. The other one, they broke the bolt off in the, in the hub carrier and, and uh, yeah, they, they screwed it all up. Uh, so I got all the suspension fixed and got the rear toe fixed, uh, figured out and, and everything's good with that. Uh, uh, power steering had a leak. Um, uh, Jake was even out of power steering pumps at the time. Like, uh, I called Jake and was like, uh, dude, like, uh, the dealer can't get one. I can't get one from RM European. Can't get one from Pelican. Can't get one from, uh, FCP. And he's like, I'm out of them. He says, everyone I've got in stock right now is dedicated to a bill. I don't have it. Um, uh, got lucky and found a guy that, uh, had a relationship with Porsche classics and, uh, was able to get literally one of the last two power steering pumps on the planet that Porsche had control of and got that fixed. And then as soon as I got the power steering pump back in, uh, the bushing, uh, where the, uh, there's a, a bracket that bolts onto the top of the engine case, the power steering pump comes in from the back and then the tensioner comes in right next to it. And there's an arm that comes through on the M96 motors for your tensioner pulling. And apparently that bushing and that, and that bracket had worn out and uh, so I had to order one of those. And uh, it's been, you know, I bought the car in 20, uh, very end of 2016. Um, drove the car for a couple of years, completely stock. It wasn't a, it wasn't a showroom quality car. It wasn't a, uh, it had some cosmetic issues. It had a couple of small mechanical niggles. And I knew as I owned the car, I would fix it. And through my ownership and through being in the Porsche community, found out about Jake and his program and really wanted to get involved with that. And uh, Jake did me a solid when the uh, IMS, the Chinesium IMS bearing that some uh, dealership installed for me as a, as an extra bonus, the hand grenade uh, about two years after I bought the car. God. <laughs> Jake did me a solid, I, I guess in a, in a kind of a way, uh, I, I was uh, sort of a test case or whatever for the, the program that Jake's got going now. And that Jake was like, he, I posted, Hey, does anybody have a used M96 engine? I just blew mine up. And Jake saw the post on one of the local Porsche uh, social media sites and sent me a, a Facebook message and was like, 
hey, what's going on? And he and I were messaging uh, through the night. Uh, he was telling me what to do. Uh, he got the car diagnosed, uh, told me, uh, yeah, I, I know what happened. Uh, he's texted me the next day and said, hey, I don't do this, uh, but I've, I, I happen to have one engine that's in process that's not spoken for. And uh, if you need it, uh, uh, you know, we can work out uh, a way to get your car up here and get, get this uh, engine put in. So that's how I got my, my stage two four liter. And um, the engine's been fantastic. The mechanical part of it has been absolutely, you know, dead nut, solid, reliable. I've never had to worry about it um, since I got it back. Um, it's just been all the stuff around the motor that, that uh, I've been dealing with ever since. I've, you know, there's a couple guys in the, in the F, F, FSI community that have uh, what I consider like uh, museum quality or, or garage queen quality cars. And uh, mine is far from that, but I've been working on it. And uh, the, the one thing that really kind of keeps me motivated and keeps me wanting to stay active in fixing the car and getting it in good shape and getting it um, uh, uh, looking like uh, a really nice example of a 996.2 is, is uh, the fact I've got Jake's engine and the fact of all the other guys in the in the owner's lounge that are like, Hey, I did this this weekend, or Hey, I went on this cruise this weekend. or Hey, you know, I just got, and I've posted some stuff about my maintenance and my repairs and stuff like that. And I think that's, that's a big part of the, being a, a member of this community is we kind of encourage each other to keep, you know, Hey, I tried this out and it went work great. Or, Hey, I tried this out and it sucks. Don't use it. And, uh, you know, Hey, I just did, you know, clean out the radiators on my car and look at all the stuff I found and make sure you do it every year. And it kind of, kind of, uh, keeps me motivated to get in the garage and do some wrench therapy on the weekends. And uh, matter of fact, I've got the, the uh, catted X pipe that uh, you guys did up there uh, sitting in the garage waiting to get put on right now. So uh, that, that's my next task is to get the, the catted X pipe installed. Cool. Yeah. I'm working on those instructions right now that you guys that, that got, there was like four or five guys that bought those I'm working with JC. He's installing his now. And before I did the instructions, I wanted to see what what problems somebody would have. This is a do it yourself or would have. Because with me, you know, it's it, when you do this stuff all the time and you created it, you you write the instructions a different way. But it's like that's not really what the guy needed. That was going to be a do a do it yourself or so. I'm working on that. So those yeah. will be done in a few days. And yeah. then before I forget about it, all you guys that bought those custom laser etch plaques. Um, Ava finished the last ones today. Okay. So we've, yeah, she's, she's had a lot going on with school and this and that, and she's not oh, been at the shop very much, but yeah. she finished them today. Yeah, that's good. And then Bruce, Bruce, yours did not get put in the car because we ended up not driving to Cleveland that day. So we're going to mail them to you. So that's why they weren't in there. But anyway, well, just want to let you guys know. I still want my like, no mobile one oil cap. <laughs> well, we can do that. We can do that. Well, just just like I brought up, uh, Judd, I'm gonna say Ava. <laughs> high fives from everyone in this group. You're um, here. <laughs> Ava, Ava is an amazing little lady, and uh, the fact that she's within a year of my own daughter makes me feel a little special about it. But uh, but I am so stoked that she helps you with everything that you're working on. And, Excited. Yeah, she goes through stages. Well. Obviously, you know, like one well, week course. she'll be one week she'll be be all into it, and then the next week she's playing with baby dolls, and the next week she wants to go flying, and the next uh, week we're going we're going deer hunting, and the next week she wants to go shoot. It's it just it's just one of those things. So, but that's what it is, right? Yeah, that's, we, that's having a daughter that age in this timeline that we're living in. Um, and my my daughter's the same way, and I'm super just, wait, it'll just when she's into something. So like yeah. I'm I'm stoked that that Ava was at least into this for that length of time to make it happen. Yeah. Well, and so she awesome. earned money to do by doing this, and then she took that part of it that she's already collected, and you know she got her a new Chromebook. And I was like, so why did you want that? She goes to make it easier to do my work because oh. she likes to do tickets. So she she reinvested what she's making 
in to do the other device work. that she can use to do other work. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Good for her, man. Like seriously, good for her. Um, I think we all have daughters Jake, that are what eleven or twelve years old. Eleven. Jake and yeah. I. Yeah. yeah Jake, okay. Jake's wait, daughter's eleven. Just, just My daughter's gonna be twelve in July. <laughs> so like we compare pretty regularly. But uh, yeah, hey. I I can't I can't imagine having a better kid than he has. And I'm pretty sure that if he met my kid, he'd feel the same way. Like, yeah. And so, so Ava, she, she was actually born with a spinal birth defect and she had to have surgery like two days after she was born. And, um, so now on February 6th, she has to have another surgery and it's just to go in and correct some, you know, scar tissue and stuff from the surgery when she was an infant. So that's had her a little bit, here and there but she's she she's sucking it up she's dealing with it she's been tough she's she had many broken bones and she's had stitches and everything you can imagine um and, and to this point you know with the surgery she had when she was an infant she's been just like any other 11 year old but we started noticing some symptoms of some things and sure. you know and they they said they need to fix it so it's not a super critical surgery but it's not not any fun so i have i have two adult daughters and i just tell i mean i hope this doesn't happen but when the hormones kick in um they'll come back when they're about 20 years old back to being human again <laughs> So, I mean, I totally expect it to happen. And when it happens, it's okay. I mean, you know, at least I've been around people. I've I've heard that enough. I've heard it enough where I know it's going to happen and it's going to be fine. So it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And they're, they're great adults, you know, and that's the idea. Well, listen, thanks so much, Jake. Um, You guys have been great, man. Thank you, Bobby too, for, for hosting this. No problem. Swapping stories just as, you know, a customer and a member of the community, this is uh, invaluable to me. And I'm learning every day. I even know how to untwist the oil pan thingy. <laughs> Lefty Lucy, man. Lefty Lucy, righty tighty. Right, right. That's next. <laughs> yeah. But but I'm getting that. I want to get the class together. You know, it, awesome. it'll, it'll be, we might do it at LM. We might do it here. I might do one at each place. I doubt that'll happen, but it's a possibility. Like do one there this year and one down here next year or something. Um, but we can do it at either place effectively. And it's just a matter of of getting together. It'll be a little bit of, of PowerPoint paralysis uh, coupled with wrenching on a car, you know, and, and, awesome. and doing an oil change and pulling a sump plate and doing this and doing that. And, and we'll do things that are not just engine related. You know, we might do a brake job. We might do uh, CV joints. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we might do, uh, different things that can be done, service of transmission, you know. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. You can change a battery. I mean, it, it, some of it, you know, I'm taking this like ground level stuff. Uh, and, and I've even done that with enthusiasts. I've truly had a guy show up to an engine rebuild class who was an enthusiast. And we were taking apart two engines at the same time. I had two teams. I basically had my classroom split down the middle. I'm like left side on this engine, right side on that engine. The left side guys had an engine that was po- it was kind of partially taken apart already the guys on the right had a fully complete engine so the guys on the right their engine even had the spark plugs the guy on the left their engine didn't have spark plugs so there's a guy that came over and he goes i got a question for you and he was all timid about it and i said what's that he goes what is that and he's like our engine doesn't have it what is that and he was pointing at the spark plug he didn't know what a spark plug was so he He's was part of the class. Runner. He was part of the class where we built an engine. This is the thing. When we got to the point of putting in the pistons and following my procedure for doing the pistons and doing the cam timing, he schooled everybody else there because he paid yeah. attention and he knew that he was the underdog because everybody else was a technician except for him and maybe one other guy. But he beat the technicians' asses using those tools. And he didn't know what a spark plug was. He was careful and he paid attention. And that's key. It's all about paying attention. And the thing is, I set the class up for him. I set the class up for that guy. I mean, he's, he's the person who I expected to come to the class. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. 
All right, guys. Well, it's been a great time. We'll do this again. Thanks a bunch, Jake and Bobby. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. Yeah, yeah thank thanks, you guys Jake. for the invitation. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Yep. We'll see you guys around. Yeah. All right. Really enjoyed it. All right. Awesome. Have a good evening. Thanks, good, good night. Okay. Yep, we'll good night, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Good night.